Hi everyone, thanks for coming to watch our talk. Uh, so just to introduce myself, I'm Helena Davis, a PhD student at King's College in London. And today I, along with Alish and Zainep, will be, will be presenting our new review, The Genetics of Eating Disorders. And this is on behalf of all the authors that worked on it. So just to start, this is a timeline of advances in eating disorder genetics. And I apologise for the small font. I uh, am not expecting you to be able to read everything that it says. Um, but it's mainly there just to demonstrate how far we've come. So from the introduction of epidemiological twin studies in 1991, all the way to finding eight genome-wide significant hits for anorexia in 2019. And now efforts are continuing and we're moving even further towards unlocking the, unlocking the biological basis of eating disorders. And today we'll go into uh, some of these findings in a little bit more detail. So this is what I'll be going over before passing you on to Alish. So I'll discuss twin studies, genome-wide association studies, SNP-based genetic correlations, and genetic risk scores. But first, just to briefly go over the main features of each eating disorder that we discuss in our review. So anorexia is the least common but most deadly of all the eating disorders and is defined by a significantly low body weight, restrictive eating behavior, and body image disturbance. Uh, in contrast, bulimia nervosa is characterized by binge eating and then engaging in compensatory behaviors. So this includes things like self-induced vomiting and laxative use. And finally, those with binge eating disorder also binge eat, however, don't engage in compensatory behaviors. So these are the eating disorders that we discuss in the review. However, other eating and feeding disorders do exist, but there's a lack of genetic and epidemiological research into them. So just to start moving into twin studies. So these were the first studies to suggest a genetic component of eating disorders. And the heritability estimates were pretty substantial. So they range from 16 to 74% for anorexia, 28 to 82% for bulimia, and 39 to 45% for binge eating disorder. And as you can see, these vary quite a bit, and this depends on whether we use threshold or relaxed DSM criteria. So for example, anorexia, uh, the heritability of anorexia increases when we expand the definition of anorexia to include sub-syndromal cases. Um, twin studies can also tell us about the genetic overlap between eating disorders. So they've told us that around 60% of the genetic effects of anorexia and bulimia may be shared. And they also can tell us about the genetic overlap between eating disorders and other psychiatric disorders. And there's evidence to suggest that eating disorders share genetic effects with alcohol and substance use disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and major depressive disorder. However, whilst twin studies are great in showing us the relative contribution of genetics and environment on human traits, they don't tell us anything about the biological and molecular mechanisms involved in risk. And this is where molecular genetic approaches come in. So after candidate gene studies and linkage studies had little success and they also failed to replicate, uh, genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, became the dominant approach to uh, exploring genetic variation across complex disorders. And genome-wide association studies are hypothesis-free. And what they do is they compare the genomes of those with a trait or illness to those without that trait or illness uh, to discover uh, differences in the genetics uh, associated with the phenotype of interest. So, so far, all GWAS for eating disorders have been conducted on anorexia, and this is because there's a lack of genetic data on other eating disorders. And the PGC has conducted the two most recent GWAS, with the latest one in 2019 finding eight genome-wide significant hits and a SNP heritability estimate of 11 to 17 percent. But what's really interesting is that if we take all these GWAS results all together, is it tells us that um, firstly that it supports the polygenic nature of anorexia and also tells us, us, us that with increasing sample size, we're more likely to be able to detect novel risk variants associated with risk. 
And this is the Manhattan plot of the latest PGC GWAS. Um, and the clearest evidence were for the single gene loci that intersected with the four genes in red here. And the authors concluded that these genes are likely to have a role in the etiology of anorexia. And this is really exciting. However, it's only the beginning because we expect hundreds of genes to be associated with anorexia. So now I'm moving on to SNP-based genetic correlations. So these provide insight into the overlapping genetics of traits and give further clues to their biological basis as they indicate where some of the same genes are operative. And what we've got here is all the significant genetic correlations from the latest PGC anorexia GWAS. And just to break it down for you, so here in the red brackets are the positive genetic correlations with psychiatric disorders or traits. Um, and this confirms previously reported patterns of comorbidity with OCD, depression, schizophrenia, and uh, anxiety. And next, here are some positive genetic correlations with educational attainment. So this includes things like years of education and college completion. And here is a newly discovered genetic correlation with physical activity. And this is actually really interesting because compulsive exercise is a core feature of individuals with anorexia or can be a core feature of individuals with anorexia. And this has traditionally been explained away as a drive to lose weight. But what this genetic correlation shows is, is that this may also have a genetic origin. So some of the same genes that influence risk for anorexia are also associated with high physical activity. And this could help to shift our understanding of anorexia away from a purely drive for thinness explanation. And next are some newly discovered uh, genetic correlations with metabolic activity. Um, and these are metabolic traits that are typically considered healthy. So these are things like a lower risk of type 2 diabetes and a positive genetic correlation with HDL cholesterol. So that's a good type of cholesterol. And these so-called healthy traits may actually have effects that are undesirable, such as um, causing individuals with anorexia to store less of their food intake as fat, which might explain um, why anorexia can be so challenging to treat. And finally, here are some negative genetic correlations with anthropometric traits. So these are to do with measurements and proportions of the human body. Uh, so for example, there's a negative genetic correlation with BMI and body fat percentage with anorexia. And again, this could help to explain why people with anorexia have such a hard time maintaining a higher weight and may help us move away from explaining low BMI as solely a result of a drive for thinness or body dissatisfaction. And interestingly, another study found a positive genetic correlation between anorexia with binge eating and cannabis initiation whereas they found a negative genetic correlation between anorexia without binge eating and smoking phenotypes. And this is evidence for potential differences in the genetic architecture of anorexia subtypes. So now moving on to genetic risk scores. So the GWAS results for anorexia hint at the presence of thousands of unidentified genetic variants, which each have a small effect on the phenotype. And genetic risk for anorexia can be represented with a genetic risk score. And this is the sum of risk alleles weighted by the effect size from the GWAS. However, genetic risk scores for eating disorders are in their infancy because we need larger, more well-powered GWAS to be able to take them further. However, what is, what is interesting is that there's a, an association between genetic risk scores for psychiatric traits, so that's things like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and anthropometric traits, with eating disorder diagnosis and symptom phenotypes. And excitingly, there are many future uses of genetic risk scores in eating disorder research. Um, and there's just some listed here. But for example, they can be used to evaluate whether GWAS findings generalize to, to multi-ethnic populations um, for which we might not have GWAS findings yet. Hi, my name is Alish Palmas, and I'm gonna to talk to you about the molecular genetics of eating disorders. Um, covering the following points. Psychiatric disorders are highly comorbid with one another and at times differentiation of a diagnosis based on symptoms may be complex, suggesting shared risk. Cross disorder GWAS have begun to investigate common genetic pathways in the etiology of psychiatric disorders and one such effort that included anorexia and seven other psychiatric disorders 
listed on the slide identified 109 independent low cytopenia pleiotropic with the 18Q21.2 region showing pleiotropic association with all eight disorders. Also anorexia, OCD, and to a smaller extent, Tourette syndrome clustered together at the genetic level. Across the sort of GWAS of anorexia and OCD, found that the genetic correlation of the anorexia OCD cross disorder phenotype resembled the genetic correlation patterns of both disorders. When the unique contribution by anorexia and OCD were examined, the metabolic and anthropometric correlations observed were driven primarily by anorexia and not OCD. Also, a gene set enrichment analysis using anorexia and OCD datasets revealed an overlap in many common features of brain regions and developmental stages for anorexia and OCD, suggesting a role for future sequencing efforts alongside GWAS to better understand the biological nature of the shared risk between anorexia and OCD. Mendelian randomization analysis uses linkage disequilibrium independent genome-wide significant SNPs identified in GWAS as instrumental variables for a given exposure and measures the degree to which the exposure is causally associated with the outcome. In the most recent PGC GWAS of anorexia, an MR analysis revealed a causal bidirectional relationship between anorexia and BMI, whereby genetic risk variants for anorexia led to lower phenotypic BMI, and genetic variants for lower BMI led to phenotypic anorexia. In general population samples, MR results point towards a positive causal association between higher BMI and eating disorder behaviors and symptoms. Adiponectin is a fat-derived hormone that plays a key role in energy homeostasis and appetite regulation. Altered adiponectin levels have been observed in patients with anorexia and bulimia. An MR study found that higher blood adiponectin was causally associated with eating behavior disinhibition. These studies point towards innate biological drivers that may lead towards symptoms of eating disorders. MR for eating disorder research is in its infancy, since the strength of genetic instruments in MR is determined by well-powered GWAS. Recent MR approaches allow for non-linear associations, which may significantly advance the application of MR in eating disorder research in the future. Genetic studies have started to explore the role of rare and structural variants in eating disorders. Regarding studies of copy number variants, one study found no evidence that anorexia cases had a significantly higher burden of CMVs than controls. However, they identified a recurrent 13Q12 deletion in two cases and CNVs disrupting the CNTN6 and CNTN4 region in several other cases. Another study found another anorexic case with a deletion in the 13Q12 region, and the authors observed two instances of CNVs with at least 50% reciprocal overlap with regions associated with psychiatric and neurodevelopmental disorders. In addition, mixed results have been found for mitral duplications at 15Q11.2 region. Whole exome and whole genome analyses have also provided evidence for an enrichment of rare variants in anorexia. A whole exome analysis in two independent families with males with anorexia found variants in the NNAT gene, which is involved in brain development. Another study combined exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, and linkage analysis to examine two families with a recurrence of anorexia. They found a missense variant co-segregating with the affected family members in the estrogen-related receptor alpha and a potentially damaging mutation in the histone deacetylase 4 in the second pedigree. These genes are linked to the estrogen system. A whole genome sequencing analysis in six individuals, two maternally linked cousins with severe anorexia and their parents, found of the approximately 5.3 million variants per individual analyzed, that almost 500,000 variants were shared identical by descent by cousin pair and identified normal variants in seven genes. These findings suggest that there may be a utility in whole genome sequencing of families with affected individuals to detect rare variants that may influence anorexia. Despite strong evidence for the heritable polygenic risk of anorexia, rare variant contribution of large effects have not yet been identified. Early studies show promise, and larger scale studies with well matched control groups and replication studies will be necessary for eliminating whether rare and structural variants contribute to eating disorders. Gene expression offers insight into the genes and molecular mechanisms that influence phenotypes. One study which investigated the brain regions enriched for gene expression to understand the molecular neuroanatomy of anorexia combined the gene lists from two common variants, a rare variant, and a stem cell study, and used genetic and transcriptomic resources spanning human, fetal, and adult and mouse gene expression data. Genes associated with anorexia resided in subcortical feeding and reward circuits, and furthermore, they implicated microglial genes and genes responding to fasting in mice hypothalamus. Likewise, the PGC's GWAS of anorexia found an enrichment of gene expression 
in the CNS brain tissues and striatal hippocampal neurons linked to feeding and reward. Another study applied transcriptome expression profiling in anorexia from inpatient admission to discharge. Of the top differentially expressed genes, findings revealed that the CPA3 and GATA2 expression were positively associated with levels of leptin, a hormone linked to nutritional status and the immune response. Another study examined gene expression in anorexia before and after weight restoration, and of the top 20 genes reported downregulation of a cholesterol side chain cleavage enzyme and upregulation of genes related to protein secretion, protein signaling, defense response to bacterial regulation, and olfactory receptor regulation. Another study modeled anorexia using induced pluripotent stem cells with the transcriptomic analysis revealing a novel gene, TARC1, that may contribute to anorexia pathophysiology. The TARC1 gene encodes a neurokinin 1 receptor, which is involved in a range of biological processes, interacts with several neurotransmitters, and has previously been associated with anxiety disorders, bipolar disorder, and ADHD, suggesting a novel system that might contribute to anorexia symptoms. Although several studies on gene expression in eating disorders exist, there are not many and most have small samples, limiting the conclusions that can be drawn. In epigenetic research, global methylation resulted in mixed, with largely inconsistent findings and opposite effects. EWAS have, however, identified TNXB1 hypermethylation, although this, the significance level was nominal and therefore a false positive finding cannot be ruled out. TNXB plays a role in maintaining muscles, joints, organs, and skin, and regulates the production of collagen. Further studies would need to replicate this finding using larger samples, but these early findings could indicate epigenetic changes in people with eating disorders. Notably, future studies need to be well-designed in order to disentangle epigenetic differences in eating disorder patients by disorder type, tissue type, cell type, and take into account large numbers of environmental factors such as diet, binge eating, and purging behaviors, as well as medication. Gene environment interaction studies have predominantly focused on candidate genes relating to behavior, emotions, and the stress response, such as serotonin and glucocorticoid genes. However, these candidate gene studies are subject to false positive results as well. Another avenue to study gene environment interaction is via the use of genetic risk scores to capture the genetic effect. Recent studies have begun modeling genetic risk scores by environment interactions in various psychiatric disorders with some very interesting findings. However, this methodology is still in its infancy and has not yet been applied to eating disorders due to a lack of well-powered GWAS needed to calculate the genetic risk scores themselves. In the future, we are likely to see a great advancement in this area of study. Thank you very much for listening. The second area is the expansion of eating disorder phenotypes. Currently, anorexia nervosa is the only eating disorder for which we have GWAS results, and efforts are underway to include other eating disorders, such as bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder in future GWASs. And taking this one step further, we also need to gain a better understanding of how phenotype measurement, so more specifically with diagnoses obtained through clinical interviews serving as gold standard, how register data, electronic health records, questionnaire-based algorithms, and self-report may affect genomic findings. And finally, future GWAS efforts should also include intermediate phenotypes that go beyond an eating disorder diagnosis, as well as symptom level investigations. The third area is functional genomics. As we continue to discover common and rare variants associated with eating disorder risk, functional genomic analyses will be needed in order to convert these insights into an understanding of the underlying biological mechanisms. And as sample sizes increase and we have better statistical power, we will be able to utilize an array of computational methods such as statistical fine mapping, EQTL analysis, TWAS, gene set enrichment analysis, as well as molecular biology-based approaches such as RNA-seq, ChIP-seq, IC, chromatin accessibility assays, and knockout animal models for future functional follow-up. To summarize the state of the eating disorders genetic research as per our review, over the last few years, we have gained tremendous insights into the genetic architecture of anorexia nervosa, and we will continue to do so as our sample sizes increase. As of now, several disease-associated loci and over 130 genes have been linked to anorexia nervosa, and we have uncovered genetic correlations with psychiatric, cognitive, metabolic, and anthropometric traits. 
And now efforts are needed in order to elaborate on the functional context of these discoveries. And a peek over the horizon into clinical management suggests that patient screening, care, and outcomes may improve from advances in molecular genetics. And as discussed earlier, genomic discovery depends on very large sample sizes and large scale global collaborations. There are numerous international projects taking place to boost the sample sizes for anorexia nervosa and to add other eating disorder phenotypes to future GWASs. For instance, in the next few years, large scale studies such as the Eating Disorders Genetics Initiative and Binge Eating Genetics Initiative will be important to watch for advances and progress as they, among other ongoing studies, will make significant contributions to the work carried out by the Eating Disorders Working Group of the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. And with that, on behalf of my co-presenters, I would like to acknowledge and thank our co-authors on this paper. Uh, we would also like to acknowledge and thank PGCED co-chairs, Cynthia Bulick and Jerome Breen, the International Society of Psychiatric Genetics for this platform, Psychiatric Genomics Consortium for this opportunity, our funding sources, and we would also like to thank you for your time and your attention.